The problem with all of this is we're trying to do forensics from outside the system. We don't have people inside saying, this is why they're hiding this, this is why they're hiding that. And even if we did, would we believe them? A lie is different at every level. And they have their set of lies that they're being told. So to really do this, you have to rely on the evidence itself. And then you have to rank that evidence in terms of the political realities of the entire culture in which you live, i.e. the United States, or the larger culture in which we live, which is the world. And when I look at the world and I look at what's going on right now, the most intense fractional confrontations, the reasons for more bloodletting, more slaughter, more pain, more suffering, more conflict on this planet than any other is the religious idea that my God is bigger than your God. In fact, your God isn't anything and you aren't anything either. And when you look at the presidential debates this year, what has come to the fore? Overwhelmingly, again and again and again, the religious background of the candidates. The founding fathers, that whirring sound you hear in the background is the founding fathers spinning in their graves because they tried to set up a political system where we separated politics from religion, politics from our metaphysical ideas of who we are, what we are doing on this planet, who our creator is, et cetera, et cetera. And what we're seeing as the 21st century evolves, even in these first few years, is a blending and a fusion of religious perspectives with the body politic. And you just look at what the schism is now that is confronting everyone, which has given us the freedom, I'm using that in quotes, to create the patriot subversions of the Constitution, to create the NSA eavesdropping. It's all about religion. It's these bad guys, those nasty terrorist Muslims, the conflict of civilizations, that those people are out to basically ultimately kill all of us. You know, the only good Muslim is a dead Muslim, which of course is what the radicals on our side are saying, even though they claim that's not what they're saying. So we're living in a levels of levels of illusion where at the base, it's all about religious difference and religious intolerance and religious obsession that my God is the only God and you deserve to be killed because you don't believe in my God. Into that mix, you introduce the idea, a la Brookings, this official NASA report, that when NASA went out into space, it would logically find evidence of possibly more advanced beings. And it said in the charter, you know, on the moon, Mars, or Venus. Well, advanced beings would have to be created by somebody, right? Whose God would create them? Was it your God? Was it my God? So when you go to the moon, like what I have on the screen, and as part of the Apollo program, you find what appears to be the head of a robot a sentient being created by something greater than humankind and lesser than the angels, etc., etc. And then you see that in our own fiction, in George Lucas's Star Wars, there is this stunning similarity in our popular cultural mythos. The question has to arise, who in NASA knew what when and were terrified to tell us because of the religious implications. Now, if you look at ruins on the moon, or you look at ruins on Mars, particularly if you have a mile long face on Mars, mile plus or minus, and it looks like us, remember there's this key phrase in the Old Testament, God created man in his image. Oh, wait a minute. If that's true, then what is this mile long face doing lying on Mars? Mars isn't mentioned in the Old Testament. Who were the Martians? Were they created in God's image? Is that God's image lying in the desert? In other words, you begin to get into such levels of discourse and such levels of potential controversy and conflict and people killing each other over their version of the truth that Brookings said in 1959 and John Kennedy gave it to Congress in 1961, 60, I'm sorry, on April 18th that it's better to leave all of this alone, to not let anybody know about this because all they'll do is kill each other over whose God is behind this new version.
of the truth. And I think, based on history, right on CNN right now, that that's the ultimate reason, which has been used as an excuse, incidentally, if the lie is different at every level, it's the excuse based on some stuff going on in our culture, that if in fact people were to know unequivocally that we're not the only conscious beings in the universe, the level of religious factionalism would rise to an hysteria and we would literally dissolve in whatever conflagration you can imagine. And that a lot of good people, remember there are good guys and bad guys, a lot of good people are going along with this because in their minds, to quote, you know, uh, Nicholson, we can't handle the truth. Okay, so NASA is out there to protect us from the truth because we can't handle the truth. The truth being But according that, to whom? Remember, it's always according to who's writing the script. Okay, but, but what, according to what you're telling me... I'm this saying some is, good people in NASA believe that. Okay, but the, Others you're saying, believe other things. You're saying this is the main reason for the secrecy. I think it's the main reason they've been able to get so many people to go along with it for so long. Because okay. remember, everybody wants to be a good guy. Right. Do you wake up in the morning thinking you're a bad guy? No. no. You think you're doing something positive. That's you're because advancing I'm a good guy. No. I'm, you're I'm advancing humanity. It. You know, doing these programs, putting it on the internet, yes. putting, you know, do tell. You're trying to expose the truth because the truth will set you free. Well, what they have been told is the truth will kill you. Exactly. Okay, and so, but they if, have believed it. That's the key pernicious thing here. They have ignored, in many cases, their own Bible. And they think by suppressing the truth, they're making us free. Okay, but let's get to this truth. What you're telling me is the truth is that the ruins on the Mars and Mars and Moon indicate that we are not alone. Oh, that's, that's not the issue. The issue is, are we involved? Are they our ruins? Are they? Are those, I'm asking the question. Are they our ruins? Did the great, 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 great grandmothers of the human race, created in God's image, right. put that stuff well, there? Well, if, if they are our ruins and, that, and they were created like us and they were us, our ancestors, whatever, then we don't have a relig religious problem because, hey, they're our ancestors. Or if they're not, and they were created by super alien beings who made us as a laboratory experiment and put us here to do what we're doing, which is not very well, not very good, then those guys become God. We're right. eavesdropping, we're trespassing literally on God's territory as you define God, which is not the big guy that I've been thinking of all my life since I grew up reading the Catechism but something lower than the angels that basically is as fallible and as human and as mortal as all of us, but has been someone playing God. Is Can you this, imagine? Is if, this your premise, though? Are yeah, you it, investigating this? Of course. When you're looking at these ruins? I'm investigating all of this. Okay. The problem is how? It's very hard. It's really, really hard because you can't trust people who would tell you the truth. You have to find the original sources. And ultimately, we've got to go to Mars or the moon and find the libraries. But then, of course, it's like, who's going to read them? Who's going to translate them? How do we have checks on the translators? How do we know the translations won't be cooked, that they won't be faked to, to abide with certain creeds, affirm that certain gods are real, or a god, but the other guys are pretenders? You have to... To, I mean, this is not a simple labyrinth. This is down the rabbit hole, through the wormhole, out to the other universe, back through the white hole, into the other galaxy. It is not simple, which is why it has waited 40-some years for the beginnings of a ray of sunlight where people actually now finally, ultimately want to know the truth. And that gets back to the numbers and success of Dark Mission. Because ultimately, what has been pacing all this what has allowed this suppression of the truth to continue unabated for at least 50 years? People, you guys out there, you have wanted it. You haven't wanted to know the truth. Because if you really had, you would have known the truth a long time ago. You're the problem, as opposed to being the solution. And just now, those of you who are watching are possibly becoming part of the solution to finding the truth. Now I want to ask you if if you're investigating what we found on Mars and the Moon, and you are, clearly, 
you've got documented evidence that you're you know tracing you're tracing this incredible dome right made out of I don't even know what on top of the moon that covers well, it, it's several domes made of glass okay the simplest explanation is it's made of glass the reason is because when we look at the Apollo analyses of the stuff they brought back which I by and large believe in because it's like why cook those books which is the chemistry overwhelmingly it's silicon dioxide which is glass okay it's also what the earth is made of you know how do you make glass here how do you make huge beautiful windows like this you basically take the most common elements in the earth's crust you heat them up you know you refine them you know you you, you melt them you put them on these steel plates or rollers and you roll it out you press them, you know and you make sheets of glass plate glass so it looks like the lunar ruins are made out of the most common material you find on the moon which by the way when you make ruins structural buildings out of glass on the moon they're 20 times stronger than steel and the reason is there's no water on the moon there's no atmosphere there's no impurities that get into the glass that make it weak and brittle hmm. so on the moon glass is a structural material and it has I mean if you dope it with various minerals metals um, you can make it do all kinds of cool things like you can make it photochromic where when it's exposed to sunlight it gets dark like sunglasses you know where they darken down automatically and then as the lunar night would come it would open up you could make it radiation resistant you could make it semi-transparent so only certain wavelengths come in other wavelengths are blocked I mean on the moon on the front side if you're at a place called uh, Sinus Medi the middle bay when you look up directly overhead there is this gorgeous earth hanging overhead spinning on its own axis with clouds day after day week after week month after month the best real estate on the moon to see the earth would be right there and that's where we found our first amazing set of ruins in fact would you like me to show you what some of those ruins look like sure segue okay as part of our lunar investigation going back now to 1996 which is 11 years I brought in a variety of experts in enterprise to look at various aspects of this impossible to believe story at first hand namely that Apollo went to the moon the astronauts went there specifically charted by NASA by the president as a mandate to go and find the technology secretly and bring it back and back engineer it and that the Apollo the race with the Russians to get to the moon before them was a cover story and we know that now because we have memos which are in the book in dark mission from the White House from the State Department we have testimony from Premier Khrushchev's own son Sergei who was a fellow I think at Brown University who confirms that from the moment that Kennedy walked into the Oval Office in 1960 after he was inaugurated on that afternoon of January 20th he opened a dialogue with Premier Khrushchev attempting to get him to go to the moon together now logically this is this is nuts because if we're told all these years that the reason we went to the moon was to beat the Russians why were we going to the moon at all spending all that money at all doing anything out there if it wasn't to beat the Russians if in fact secretly we were trying to go with the Russians the only logical answer is there was something there that Kennedy felt was of overriding importance to humankind to civilization no matter where it is on this planet that we had to share with our arch enemies in the Cold War and ultimately as we document in the book it looks like they killed him for it and then a few months later they imprisoned Khrushchev and kept him under house arrest until his death you know several years after that but ultimately behind the scenes we may have gone to the moon with them anyway isn't this we right? don't know again okay. we don't know okay. the gaps in the record are still big enough to fly the enterprise through what we do know is that we went that Apollo went to the moon we had six missions incredible missions we had one that didn't quite work the way we wanted it to 13 which in itself itself has interesting gaps that I'm looking at in my copious spare time but what we know now from the photographs they brought back the photographs that I have looked at in the NASA archives physically held them in my hands photographs now leaked all over the web all over NASA websites all over the world for anybody to download and use a modicum of image processing like Photoshop or Coral Draw or whatever to to 
Basically, turn up the gain, turn up the brightness. Look at what's in the sky, which should be totally black. You'll find this. Now, this is actually a perfect idealized version of what you're going to find. This is a grid created by one of our experts, an architect named Robert Fiertek, who we talk about in the book, who I brought into this back in the mid-90s to analyze the photographs and tell us what was there from a structural, constructional perspective. So what Robert did is created this grid in the computer. And then what we did was to look at some of the photographs. For instance, this is a Hasselblad image from Apollo 10. The frame number is AS1032-4810. So you can go to the archive and go to the website, download this picture, and you can see there are hints that there's something in the sky, really classic lunar terrain below. All you do is turn up the brightness. Remember that song, Turn Up the Volume? <laughs> you turn up the gain. And you see this stunning grid work in the sky. Grid work which, this is a close-up now, does not belong. It's three-dimensional. It's rectilinear. It's girders up and down. It's stringers left and right. It's, it, there's no doubt in anyone's mind who has anything to do with construction, has even built a house, that this is real. It's not scratches. It's not image weirdness in the chemistry bath of the developing of the film. It's real 3D manufactured stuff. Okay, and it so what's there. your theory on who manufactured that? Well, that goes back to the photograph I showed you a few minutes ago, which was the head. Oh. Well, the head is kind of anthropomorphic, isn't it? Mm-hmm. If we believe in biological evolution, if we believe in Gaylord Simpson, who was the expert at um, Harvard back in the 1960s, who laid out this kind of Bible of human development, which Carl Sagan then ran with, human beings are totally unique. The way we look, our face, our features, our proportions, two arms, two legs, all that, if you were to run Earth's history again, you wouldn't get anything looking like us at all. And the reason they say is because if you look in the oceans, you look on land, you look at all the various species, you look at the extinct species, look at the fossil record, the only guys that look like us, we now know are genetically related. The simians, the anthropoids, the apes, the monkeys, you know, there's a, there's a family tree here. There's there, you know, Darwin was right. There is a family to which we have somehow been derived. And perhaps some of the extraterrestrial visitors as well. I don't know we don't know that. that. We don't know that. You know, again, I'm dealing with actual data I can touch. I do not do UFOs because I have to depend on stories. If you're depending on stories, you're at the mercy of anybody telling you the story. If you depend on actual documented evidence that's in an archive that anybody can download, you're in a completely different ball game. And so I listen to the stories, I try to cross-correlate them with the data, but we are data-bound. That's what makes Enterprise different from anybody else trying to do this thing. We have data. Okay, so anthropomorphically, they look like us. Yes. What has that got to do with what you're finding on the moon? I'm getting there. Okay. Yes. I always try to get someplace. Sure. Right? So back to the robot head. Yes. Why does the robot look like us? It could look like anything. It could look like R2-D2. Remember, R2-D2 did not look like us at all. Right. He, cute and, you know, like, almost like a little trash can, you know, yes. with blinking lights and a beam and all that. So he looks like C-3PO, mm -hmm. who is an anthropomorphic robot in human image. Mm -hmm. So the fact that Apollo went to the moon and on Apollo 17, Gene Cernan and Harrison Schmidt may have seen that thing. They may have picked it up. They may have brought it back as part of their mandate. We don't know any of those facts yet because they're not talking. Why do we have a photograph of it? There are like 15 photographs of it. I know, but did they take the picture? They took the pictures. But when you take a picture on the moon, remember, they're not looking through a viewfinder. The, the camera was strapped to their chest. I have a photo. The fact is the only way you aim the camera was your body in your spacesuit. Okay. And you're sitting behind a glass. Hasselblad. Very high quality camera. Yes. But they're not looking at the scene. They're looking at the scene and they're taking pictures by moving their whole body so they may not have even seen this. It was so far away. It's in the bottom of a crater which is the size of a football field. Well, who found it? I did. 
You do? I'm the first guy to find it, of course. What do you think? That's why you're here, aren't you? <laughs> uh, okay, That's what no, we do I mean, over nice. here. Okay, yeah. You know, read the book. You found a robot head in a photograph in, in the bottom In of the 14 page? photographs. It was photographed Amazing. again and again and again and again okay. as part of the panorama sequence. Okay. We are trying now to go, we've gotten two copies of film, not just the web, but film, which was really crappy copies that were sent to us. Mm -hmm. And was I was able to do, edit, put computer robot comparison with C3PO, I was able to take two of those images and superimpose them very carefully, one on top of the other. This is a standard photo technique for amplifying signal and averaging noise. Because okay. every photograph has noise. If you do that, the mathematical equation says that you drive down the noise by the square root of the number of frames you can successfully, carefully superimpose. Ultimately, we got 14 frames to play with. I need higher resolution, but I've done some playing around in the computer with even those frames, and you get very interesting results. The two frames that were actually filmed that we used, we were able to superimpose them, and that's when the eyes popped out. The round irises, the camera eyes that tell me this is not a desiccated human being lying there on the moon. One of the lunar colonists that we were positing was there at one point. This is an artificial life form, a robot. We've called it Data's head. Doesn't look like Data. It looks much more like C-3PO, which opens a whole doorway to what does George Lucas know and when did he know it? And if you want, I can go there and really curl your eyebrows because we have more data that Lucas is involved up to his eyebrows in this whole interesting story and plot and conspiracy. And that's why George Lucas is so successful with those films. It's not an accident. Okay, now I, I do want to go there. <laughs> we'll I go there in a minute. We have time to go there. Phil? Uh, yeah. yeah, I have a question, Richard, if, uh, if I may, which I know has been asked by some other people. I could understand how Data's head could have been captured on film accidentally because mm -hmm. it was quite a while back and they weren't f focusing on the Hasselblads. But with these very large structures that you've identified um, on your photographs, these would clearly have been in the background for the astronauts mm -hmm. who are taking those images. Right. Why would they have permitted those images to be in the background and all they have to do is to take the photograph the other way? This is a photograph taken from Apollo 14. This is a photograph taken by Alan Shepard, who was the commander, looking north. Here's Edgar Mitchell, who I debated about all this on Art Bell Show in 1996. Here's Mitchell's shadow. Here's the incredible background dome that's arching over Mitchell that he's apparently totally oblivious to. And here is an inset area where, because I have an original print of this priceless image, saved from deliberate destruction by NASA, by a gentleman named Ken Johnston in 1971, I believe, saved for 30 years and then physically handed to me in Seattle in 1995, where I was able to put it on a computer scanner, which is pretty primitive then compared to what we have now, scan it, turn up the brightness, turn up the gain, and bingo, out popped all this astonishing geometry. When I zoomed in on the print, because I could scan it at higher and higher resolutions, I found a succeeding series of really amazing um, detailed versions of what was on the frame. You can see that at the horizon there is this lateral scaffolding, that there are angled what we call them is um, buttresses that come down at an angle from somewhere in the distance. There's multiple leveled three-dimensional cross bracing. There's something here that looks like a bullet hole in a windshield, like I took a 45 and shot, you know, so the glass is all shattered all around it, scattering light. Notice the color. The color is real. This is buried in the blue emulsion layers of the multi-layered ectochrome of the original ASA 64 film that they took to the moon and shot all those pictures with. They didn't make prints. They made transparencies. Then in the dark room, they made intermediate prints. And in the dark room, Bill, to answer your question, they took out all the good stuff. But they, also they simply erased it in the dark room. And they didn't have color film on the first. No, they, they did. No, no, no. They had color film. In fact, in fact, they had a super color film which is a whole other story. I actually knew the inventor at E&G, e who invented it. I tracked 
using it. I actually had rolls of it to use myself. When I was at CBS, I went to the Cape. I had a huge gun camera built for me by one of the key photographers in the press corps. I think he, he was a freelance guy. He worked for AP, he worked for Newsweek, People Magazine, whatever. He actually built this huge camera. It looked like a rifle. And I would aim it like that with a trigger that would trigger the, the um, uh, 35 millimeter camera with this special film. And I took photographs of the launch of the Saturn V on Apollo 8, the first mission to the moon. CBS then flew me by helicopter from New York to Boston where the lab was and out to the lab and Charlie, my friend Charlie Wyckoff, developed while I watched that film. I then took the helicopter back to New York and we put the film on the air to show what the Saturn V launch would look like with this incredible super extended range color film, which NASA had developed secretly to take to the moon. They then destroyed the lab that was built specifically to make this film. NASA destroyed the NASA. lab. NASA destroyed the okay. lab. Well, Kodak at NASA's behest. Because Charlie was asked to give the film to Kodak as part of a evaluation for eventually putting it out in the marketplace. So you and I could basically mm -hmm. have that's by the way what what the gold film now that is commercially available in drugstores, that's a version of Charlie's super wide latitude color transparency film. It was taken to the moon. They used it to take the first generation pictures with those Hasselblad cameras. They then brought it back to the dark rooms in Houston. They then made intermediate generational copies and prints. And in the dark room, all the offending ruins were removed. Yes. It was this is why this print is so important because this is from a first generation un altered print without the things taken off. It was the movie color film that I was referring to in Apollo 11 that wasn't used, but it could have been. Am I right about that? Well, they had, a, they had a color camera. Right. They had a black and white camera. Okay. They only used the black and white, and they used it in a reduced sensitivity mode because if they had used it in the original design mode built by Westinghouse, it would have shown the ruins behind Apollo 11. That's, by the way, why the original Apollo 11 tapes have disappeared. They dare not let them loose with modern computer technology. Can you imagine what we would find on them? Sure. Except those shadowy figures dancing around on the moon where there, if you know what you're looking for, even on those pictures there are hints, but there's this enormous element of plausible deniability because people can say, oh, that's just bad photography, bad lighting. So there's no proof. This is now the inset showing Mitchell and showing where we did this and showing the stunning three-dimensional geometry of the, of the glass. We call this Mitchell under glass. And yet when I talked to him on the Bell Show and debated him, he claimed to have seen nothing. And I gave him a pass at that time because I thought that part of the problem had to do with the fact that he literally could not see. This is now a close-up showing what I call the bullet hole Notice all the 3D geometry, this amazing three-dimensional lattice, which, and you can see the stair steps of brilliant glass shining, and the lunar surface is overexposed. Because remember, this is very dim. This is probably the consistency of cigarette smoke. It is so fine because it's been beaten and beaten and beaten to death by an incessant micrometeoric rain. So after how many millions of years, there's almost nothing left. But there was enough left to take pictures okay, and but bring them home. To piggyback on Bill's question, why would they leave any trace? Do they want someone to find it? Did they want you to find it? Let me continue the logic train, then we'll get to that. Okay. This is a curve, a light curve of human visual sensitivity. We are, our visual sensitivity peaks in what's called the yellow green, which is where the solar spectrum peaks, by the way, so that's probably not an accident. And as you can see, as we go toward the red end of the spectrum, it gets really low down here. This is the sensitivity curve. This is 100%. This would be zero. So it's really way down in the noise. And as you get toward the blue and the violet, it gets very noisy. So you really don't see at low light levels much of anything in the blue or the red. You may see a little bit in the green. But film, of course, has a very different sensitivity. So now we come to the astronauts. Each astronaut was outfitted, we were told, with a gold visor 
designed to protect them from ultraviolet light, like a sunscreen or Polaroid sunglasses or whatever. That's another NASA lie. I can prove it. Watch. If you look at the transmission curve of gold on plastic, and you look at the spectrum, and you look at the gold helmet, it turns out that the gold suppressed all the visible wavelengths of the bright lunar surface under shining bright sunlight and amplified the blue, meaning that those helmets allowed them to actually look out at the lunar surface and see the ruins of the domes. So they could aim their body cameras at any particular place to get the pictures of the ruins, which are pervasive and all over, so there's no way they could have pointed the camera where there weren't ruins, because they were inside an ancient shattered dome of glass where 360 degrees, this is a 360 degree panorama taken from one of the panoramas that Ken Johnson saved from the original prints and you can see that most of the stuff is to the west back scattering. Notice the geometry here. Then as you move the camera around to the north, this is where Mitchell, this is Mitchell again. This is where the grid work was that we showed in close up. Then you look toward the sun over here and toward the, toward the uh, um, south there's much less over here. You can see that it's almost dark, the way it would be if there was no glass. And then finally back to the west again as it begins to build up in what we call backscatter, where the light is kicked back. So this, this panorama, taken from an original NASA print, saved from destruction by Johnson 30 years ago, somehow this print knows where the sun is. And there's no way that any accident of chemistry, development, bad lighting, light leaks, whatever. I mean, a light leak would be toward the sun, right? Why is the biggest portion of backscatter in the sky directly opposite the sun as judged by the astronaut's shadow? In other words, his very body is shielding the camera lens from seeing any sunlight. Now, I know that some people watching this will want us to ask this question and, and, and they and want to hear your answer, and that is, some people say that you got hold of a conspiracy, but you got hold of the wrong one, because what you got hold of here is evidence of uh, back structures on a big screen in the Nevada desert, like the Truman Show. And that's what was actually being kept quiet. Now, it's not a stupid question, but I'm sure you've got an answer. Let's hear it. <laughs> we go into the book in this in great detail. To my mind, there is zero probability. I, I rarely use the word zero probability that the lunar landings were faked given all the politics, given the Nazi backstory of what they were looking for, given von Braun, given the Kennedy Khrushchev thing, why would we go if there wasn't something there to go for? But the actual proof that this is not done in a studio and is actually for real comes from an anecdotal story of my own eyewitness testimony, meaning I was at JPL when we made the transition from Downey up to JPL to cover the Mariner 6 and Mariner 7 mission. And I was there as someone in the auditorium being squired around by the head of NASA Public Affairs for JPL, named Frank Bristow, was walking this guy around who was putting some little pamphlet on every reporter's seat in the auditorium and then was led outside to hand personally a copy of this memo, whatever it was, to every reporter who was in the press room waiting for one of the press conferences to begin. So I got one and I read it and I was, I was flabbergasted. Because here was a guy being officially sponsored by a NASA official handing out a document that said the entire Apollo 11 mission was just completed in a studio, a soundstage in Nevada. The whole thing is a fake. And I wished I had kept that document. <laughs> We're now looking for some reporter who at the time actually is a sidebar, is a kind of a, you know, isn't it cute what things happen around these missions? actually published a story based on that two-page Mimeo handout because somebody had to have done it, possibly at the Pasadena Star News, which is one place we're looking, possibly even in the New York Times. I, I haven't looked. I haven't had time to look. The point is that there were other reporters, both well-known and no one will ever hear of them, reporters, a thousand people were covering those missions in those days. Somebody had to have kept, just as an historical anachronism, a copy of that memo. Now what that means, as I say in Dark Mission, is politically NASA itself was starting the rumor before Neil and Buzz and Mike Collins even got home 
that Apollo was a fake. Why would NASA, in their wildest dreams, be starting a rumor that would mature 30 years down the road? The answer is inoculation. The answer is that if it ever came out that there was real stuff there that they were hiding, they could divert the conspiracy crowd to the fake conspiracy that we never went to the moon by planting the seeds, by planting the meme in the culture generations before, which would then bear fruit, which it did on Fox television. Gosh, Fox television, that's interesting. <laughs> um, and it would divert those people from asking the real question, which of course is, what did they find on the moon and when did they find it and when did they decide to lie about it for all these years? So the astronauts, even Mitchell, you're saying, had a visor that actually made it possible for them to see this wall of glass. So they could take the pictures of the right stuff. Yeah. And, and photograph it. Yeah. So when you asked Mitchell and he said he didn't see anything, mm -hmm. what is your theory on why he's lying? See, Carrie is like a good attorney. She knows the answer to the question. <laughs> she never asks a question where she doesn't know the answer. So I will give oh, her the answer now true. that she knows. <laughs> I think Ed Mitchell is telling the absolute truth. Okay, now this now, answer I don't know. Ah, so she didn't know the answer. No. Because she hasn't read that part of Dark Mission. That's right. The reason, the, the resolution of this paradox is that um, Ed Mitchell has had something happen to his mind. Oh, that answer I did know. Okay. The astronauts, okay. I believe, have been tampered with. Yes. There, is, there are all kinds of papers now coming out in the open literature about technologies which can selectively wipe out your memories on specific events. And I believe, and I have in the book, Mike and I carefully put in document after document after document of reference to all of the astronauts at one time or another have complained about not being able to remember what they did on the moon. Mm. Yes, and they absolutely. come up with various rationales. Yes. You know, like some of them, like Pete Conrad, used to come up with a flip answer. Oh, it was real super G. Whiz, golly boy, was it great. Which was a cover for the fact that he was very frustrated in private conversations, on the record with certain reporters, that he couldn't remember. Mm -hmm. We had a conference in Wyoming several years ago. Wyoming is a hotbed of CIA and ex-Intel guys who were all bought big, beautiful farms and ranches, so they'll keep their mouth shut. They're basically bought off. That's how they're bought off. I was invited to present data on Mars by one of these former CIA big rancher types who had a very beautiful wife who happened to be a medical doctor. Without mentioning names, because they're still alive and I you know, would like to keep them alive, um, things got really, really, really weird. Because I was ostensibly invited to present the Mars data, Sidonia, our work, you know, at the UN, our expose and the NASA briefings, um, you know, at, at, at NASA Lewis on Mars. And suddenly I surprised them by presenting a whole bunch of stuff for the first time on the moon. Oh. And this individual freaked out. Oh, wow. And his wife, who it turned out had been one of the doctors who had debriefed the astronauts, the crew, she orbited around the conference, never even coming in, talking to some of the people who were there with us and saying, I don't know why this is so disturbing, but I, 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 I just can't sit through this. So it's the Amazing. old who watches the watchers. Even, uh. I believe, she had had her mind altered so she would not remember the truth after she had done. So how far up the chain does this go? How many watchers have they had to change their minds with some technology? And the technology is not perfect. I think we're seeing evidence that the technology again and again breaks down. Mm -hmm. If you read, for instance, Buzz Aldrin's first person testimony in his own books, he talks about how Jay Barbary, who was a colleague of mine from NBC News, I knew Jay back when I was with Cronkite. I was just a young whippersnapper, and Jay is now this senior space correspondent still covering the shuttle for NBC, asking very perceptive questions from the, from the press corps. Jay innocently invited Buzz to a, I think it was a Kiwanis Club meeting uh, up in Palmdale, which is one of the NASA facilities 
uh, north of Los Angeles where they in fact uh, have tested a lot of the components of the secret space program and the, the secret military program, including the shuttle. And so he invites him into this meeting, you know, a whole bunch of rah-rah, you know, jet jockeys and engineers and, you know, the old slap you on the back, good old boy network. You know exactly what I'm talking about. And he asks, you know, they're sitting on a stage and they got two chairs and it's like very conversation. Um, and he says to, to Jay, to, uh, to uh, Buzz, Jay asks Buzz, well, what did it feel like to walk on the moon for the first time? And in his own book, Buzz Aldrin, says that at that moment he became violently ill. He had to rush off the stage. He went out to the alley and he threw up. Wow. And his wife came out all upset because she thought something was seriously wrong, which of course it was. This is classic aversion therapy. Mm -hmm. Classic aversion therapy. Mm -hmm. So yes, I believe the astronauts are blameless. Mm -hmm. All except for Neil Armstrong. <laughs> okay. I think Neil Armstrong fully has his memories. Mm -hmm. I think Neil Armstrong, as the icon, first person of the human family now to walk on the moon, mm -hmm. has been left alone. And that is why Neil Armstrong never says anything in public about the space program. They wind him up and bring him out at a couple of these ceremonies. Like in 1994, he was at the White House with President Clinton and a bunch of students, and it was a whole arranged photo op. And he stands there making a speech, and I had someone the other night analyze the body language and his voice and talk about how incredibly nervous and incredibly um, upset he appeared to be, which you can see on tape. We have the tape. And what he started out by doing was comparing all the astronauts, the entire astronaut corps, all his colleagues who landed on the moon to parrots. Mm. He said, and parrots don't fly very well. Parrots also don't tell you the truth. Oh they tell you what they're told. At the end of his speech, he turned to the students, because the students represent, of course, the next generation. The perfect photo op. Always plant students in your audience so you make people think you're concerned about the next generation. Mm -hmm. He looked at them, little, he kind of calmed down at this point, and he said, there are wonders beyond belief on the moon for those who can remove truth's protective layers. Now, I was never taught in school that truth had protective layers. Who's protecting the truth? Mm -hmm. He was obviously referring to Brookings, to NASA, to 40 years of lies. I have a couple of questions as well. Once again, at the risk of irritating you here, Richard. Um, <laughs> there will be many people who've, who've um, uh, read your book from cover to cover, and they also read Dark Moon. And they looked at those images, and I know you're familiar with those images, just to... They're the ones where the crosshairs seem to be behind the image rather than in front of the image. Mm -hmm. They're the ones where you seem to have multiple lighting effects in terms of multiple shadows. Now, those are good questions to raise again. I know that you have dismissed those. Can you just explain briefly on what grounds you have done that? Well, dismissing is if you don't deal with it. What we, have, bit... yeah, what we have done on Enterprise and in, in Dark Mission is we have dealt with most of the common questions very effectively and very scientifically, and I think we have been able to put the issue to rest because what people who naively raise some of those questions don't know is the secret technology that was used to take the pictures. For instance, this super extraordinary color film. If you take that film and you make a first-generation copy in the camera. And then you take that copy it, when you bring it back to Earth and you make other copies. What you can do, because you have such latitude, is you adjust between the light and the dark so that it looks as if it's a perfectly lit with floodlights, spotlights, fill light picture, when in fact it was the film. It was the technology, the secret hidden technology of, of Charlie Wyckoff's XRC film that allowed them to do that. In terms of multiple shadows, no, they're not multiple shadows. There appear to be multiple angles. And these are people that don't understand how shadow angles depend on surface, you know, landscape geometry, hills, valleys, craters, the way rocks are. There, you know, then there's the common canard that they couldn't see stars. Well, Ken Johnston reports, remember, he's the 
official guy in charge of the photographs in the Lunar Receiving Laboratory from Apollo told by his people to eventually destroy all but one set of the films, who walked through one building one day and noticed that there were a group of people, three or four people, who were doing something with negatives and paint. They were painting out the sky above the horizon. And as any good manager at NASA, he said, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> and the answer was, oh, we're strippers, which is a kind of a flip answer, because that's a term that comes from Hollywood, where they would make matte paintings and they would strip them into the background film so that in Forbidden Planet, you know, you see the illusion of the monster against the Chesley Bonstell painting of the twin moon alien world, Altair IV, that the expedition landed on. So he explores it a little further and he says, well, what are you really doing? And well, the guy in charge of these several women that were doing this, they were women, by the way, um, he said, well, what we're doing is we're painting out the, the stars so that it doesn't confuse people. <laughs> now, the stars, as part of the original NASA photograph, have been a major cause of concern to a lot of these people who've been concerned that you don't see stars on a lunar picture, and they think naively that you should. Well, in fact, if you take a picture in the daytime on the moon, you're not going to see stars. The reason is the stars are so incredibly faint, and the sun is so bright that you cannot expose one picture that will be decent exposure of the surface and see the stars at the same time. You can do this on any day or night here on Earth. You know, go out on a, on a moonlit night or moonless night and try to get stars and then have someone light up the foreground with floodlights and you'll quickly see the foreground will totally overexpose even with weak, feeble, artificial illumination because the stars are so incredibly weak that you can't record the two on the same shot. Significantly for what Ken says to us is that the people who were doing the painting out obviously were painting out this stuff. They were painting out the glass ruins, the sparkles, the pieces of glass that just at the right angle would kick sunlight back into the camera lens and it would be unmistakable. There was something there in the sky that should not be there. The fact that they thought that they were painting out the stars and not the glass means they also believed the lie. The lie was different at every level and at their level of the lie they have been told we're getting rid of the stars because they'd be confusing. So it's an internally consistent story that has elements of first-person testimony, photographic evidence, corroboration on the web all over the world now from someone leaking amazing untouched generation versions probably scanned from these original XR ectochrome uh, transparencies. And it all fits together as a coherent whole that NASA has been suppressing real lunar ruins for over 40 years. Somebody who is uh, a valuable insider source of ours, and I had the good fortune to be able to talk with him at length just a very short while ago, and I know that you are very suspicious of any insider's testimony, and I understand why. But let me show you the story. And although we had... Well, it's not accompanied by yeah. physical evidence. Of course. See, the difference with Ken is he had an actual set of physical prints. I understand that. Which uh, hold yeah. up. Yeah, I understand that. But uh, this is a kind of conversation that we could have had over dinner last night and we didn't have it. Um, I asked this guy and had a lot of conversations with him about a lot of things. And uh, I thought, you know, I never asked him whether we went to the moon or not. And I said, hey, did we really go to the moon? And there was the longest silence. And I didn't know what he was going to say. It was like a really, really long pause. And eventually, he said, yes. And he said, but it wasn't that simple, he said. He said, we went there with help. He said, we had advanced technology that was not part of the formal Apollo program, was not part of accepted science at that time, that helped us get through the Van Allen belts. And actually, was also built into the LEM that enabled it to take off. Um, without leaving the blast crater and so on and so forth. Uh -huh. And he said, uh, he said the astronauts were aware of this, and this is the reason that he attributed to their reluctance to be interviewed and so on and so forth. He said it's a very complicated story, that he said most of the missions went to the moon. I didn't push him on that. But he said, yeah, he said those guys, he said it was all set up on a fake, on a fake stage. That's not true. But some of the stuff was actually 
um, uh, uh, fabricated um, in preparation for this so that the whole story would hang together in the public eye because of the, because of the complicated PR aspects of it and so on and so forth. Now, do you know this person's background? Yes, I do. You know what role he played in NASA? Um, he wasn't in NASA. He wasn't in NASA. Okay. He's worked in a lot of black projects. He was an electronic specialist. He had the opportunity. Um, he worked in Livermore. He worked for a lot of black okay. projects. He knew people. He worked for NOAA. He asked questions. Yeah. Um, he wasn't involved in NASA. Well, he wasn't involved in the program. Without talking to myself, because I think I know who you're talking about, my impression would be that he's another victim of the lies different at every level. Okay. He's been given, which satisfies his national security experience, the lie that they're covering up the technology. I understand. Because nowhere in his lexicon are they covering up ancient ruins. Yes. It's not first-hand information he was giving us. It was something that I believe he had learned during the course of his work. But that From someone else. Because he was talking to a cop. And yeah, right. I, I absolutely understand. So, but you understand how he can be honest and sincere mm. and still totally mistaken. It's the biggest problem. The because it gives him that. something that makes sense to him. Oh, they're going to hide this technology. Which, of course, if we're right, there's been a secret development of real anti-gravity technology in parallel with the public official Apollo program. There are people, in fact, uh, Joseph Farrell is one of the people in his books, this is before he got together with me, who raises this as a possibility. In fact, all the people that look at those LEM liftoffs and don't understand what they're seeing because they don't have the proper background in physics. Everything we see, including there are craters. I've seen close-ups under the limb of the crater. What makes it so interesting is that when you blow away the dust, see the natural model says that you've had dust falling on the moon for billions of years, which means it should be a nice, light, fluffy layer. So like snow, if I was to pull a rocket engine over, over you know, snow after a snowstorm, you'd get a nice, beautiful crater, right? Instead, what the astronauts found from trying to stick in flags and do drilling and other experiments is underneath that thin surface, like a few inches, maybe an inch or two, the lunar surface is damn tough. It's hard. It's, and it gets harder the deeper you go. That, of course, is in consonance with the idea that there are ruins underneath that surface. There's buildings down there. There's walls, there's beams, there's girders. The stuff you see above ground is only half the story. That's why on the current missions orbiting the moon tonight, as we're taping this, the Japanese unmanned mission, size of a Greyhound bus, the Chinese unmanned mission, size of a VW bus, they are loaded with dozens of instruments up to and including high-powered radars to ping the lower levels and see, I believe, the ruins underneath the lunar ground. Okay, is it the ruins under the ground, or is it an underground base? Same difference. You mean, well, base implies... A modern-day underground base. The moon has the surface area of North and South America combined, 15 million square miles. Right. If we have a base there, it's pretty small. So the most of the stuff you're going to find is ancient. And it's easy to uh, separate the two. Okay, do we have a base there in your opinion? I don't know. Do in my opinion. Do you think... Given that there is probably, in all likelihood, a secret space program, I would imagine there is a base. There's probably more than one. You can't do everything from one place. I mean, could we explore this planet from one base? If you have a technology that can get there in a couple of hours, effortlessly, using anti-gravity, and we do have shuttle video showing this technology which I loaned to Art Bell some years ago, and he really kept the secret. I said, Art, just sit on this. Don't tell anybody. And he kept the secret. I eventually gave it to Whitley Strieber through Art. It wound up on NBC as part of Whitley's uh, program. Um, I firmly believe that stuff is our stuff. That we're not looking at ETs, we're not going to look at little greys, little alien guys. We're looking at our secret space program. And there are reasons, again, very careful reasons laid out in the book, why I think it's our stuff. Well, if that's true, it would be silly to imagine that we hadn't built a base or bases on the moon if for no other reason you need a place to function 
to loot all this stuff and bring the good stuff home. Okay, we've heard that there are auroras flying shipments back and forth, and I guess people, I don't know. Well, aurora is a code name. It could mean anything. Oh, oh really? We, we know in the 1980s there were a series of sonic booms in the air over Los Angeles, which were recorded coming in over the Pacific and then landing probably at Edwards, you know, the super secret right. research facility up there. We heard that they were Aurora. That's all we know. Remember, this is, you know, a mystery wrapped in an enigma shrouded by a constant veil of lies. So getting at the truth, unless you've got pictures with a paper trail, with a pedigree, you can't believe. And even these, you have to do some decent analysis to understand what you're seeing. I mean, there are people that look at this and they say, Hoagland, I have a damn clue what I'm looking at. Because they don't understand how to think in terms of simple optical physics. They've never driven toward the sunset in the afternoon with the sun shining on their dirty windshield to realize that they're seeing dirty windshields. Okay, a key prediction. Remember, science is nothing if it's not prediction. A key prediction of the whole lunar dome model, the ancient lunar dome model, that somebody was there, they lived there, they built incredible extensive stuff, Apollo was sent there to find out what they could bring home with the primitive rocket technology of the 1950s and 60s. We're doing a lot better now, by the way, secretly. And one of the key predictions of the model is that if you have glass, if you have glass domes, glass ruins, people who live in glass houses see prisms. They see stunning arrays of color. And if you lived in a glass house and you looked at the sun or you look at the reflections and all that, you should see prisms over and over and over again. In these photographs, the model says that we should be able to find prisms. So I started looking. And this is a picture from Apollo 17. You can just see a hint. This is one of the newly scanned leaked images that Somebody's putting 16 megabyte files, so anybody out there can go to the web and download them and use Photoshop and bingo, you'll confirm exactly what is there. If you turn up the gain, right up here, above these mountains, which aren't mountains, by the way, they're old eroded ecologies, you find a prism. You find a stunning color shard of glass, spectrally refracting light. Now, in the model that was raised earlier, that this is all done in a sound stage, uh-uh. Because sound stages would be made of steel and aluminum and, you know, things you build out of. We don't build out of glass here because glass is fragile. Glass breaks down. Glass is not steel on Earth. Only on the moon is it 20 times stronger than steel. So this, if, if I had to bet the farm on one piece of data that we're right, it's these prisms. Because in looking at these photographs, and looking at the way the color emulsion of the ectochrome, the super ectochrome that Charlie Wyckoff, my friend who I worked with and used this film for him, developed, I know that those three layers, yellow, magenta, and cyan, when converted into a color ectochrome transparency, were obviously able of recording. Here's another one. This one has a prism going up and a prism going down. It's called birefraction. It's a double refraction. And as you look through, here's a comparison. The one I showed you first, here's the second one. Notice the angle is different. That's because it was taken at a different angle in relation to the sun. So the physics of the refraction of the formation of the prisms, here's one of my favorites. This is a, you know, the PR shot. You know, Cernan wearing the uh, commander's stripes with the flag, you know, but if you look up here in the darkness, in the dome that's over Taurus Litro, and you enlarge it, lo and behold, you find a prism, a double prism. And you can actually see it's aligned with the stringers in the glass. There's another one here. There's another one up here. These are overwhelming proof, an optical physicist proof, that what we're seeing is in fact real. Here is probably my favorite. Here is Harrison Schmidt, in the moon, lunar landscape, Taurus Littrow Valley, gray landscape, everything we've been told, 
Here's a color chart, all right? Here's our calibrator, red, green, and blue. This is the grayscale. It's called a gnomon. They would put this out in the photographs to calibrate the color. Well, the color is strangely unsaturated. It's like NASA, when they put these out, they turn down the color. You want to see why? Because when you turn the color back up to the way it should be, bingo, you have sunrise on the moon. Yeah. You have layered sunrise, just like looking outside here as you're filming this, look outside, you will see the same layering of light and color mm -hmm. under the Earth's atmosphere, except we all know, and we can prove, there is no atmosphere on the moon. Just watch a star as it goes behind the moon some night. It does not twinkle. It disappears like that. So John Lear, dear John, you're wrong. There is no atmosphere on the moon. But there are these huge grids of glass. And when you look in the right way at these pictures, remember, this is an official picture. Not only do you see the color spectrum of a sunrise, but right here, there's this nice, incredible prism made of glass, refracting sunlight back into the camera. And notice the angle. It's almost horizontal because when sh uh, Saarinen took this picture, the sun was to his back, he was facing almost directly away from the sun, and the geometry of the domes made the prism flat. This, to me, is overwhelming evidence of these ancient lunar domes. <laughs> and we've learned that NASA is very happy to adjust the color of their images from the Mars images. Oh, instantly, instantly. Wonderful. I'm done.